Welcome to the Consulting Success Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Zapersky. In this podcast, we'll dive deep into the world of elite consultants, where you'll learn the strategies, tactics, and mindset to grow a highly profitable and successful consulting business. Hi there, and welcome back to another episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. Joining Michael on the show today is Sean Shepard. Sean is the managing partner at U+, a renowned consulting firm known for creating $2 billion in new value and successfully bringing over 100 ideas to market. He has an impressive track record of selling startups to industry giants like IBM and Limelight Networks, as well as nurturing the growth of numerous early stage companies. Now, as you'll hear Sean explain, one of the significant challenges that many consulting firms and businesses in that matter encounter during their growth is reaching a point where the owner's capacity becomes a limiting factor. And to continue growing, it becomes a necessity to hire, train, and expand operations. Now, this transition can be particularly challenging for consultants, especially those looking to scale from six to seven figures which is where the consulting success team comes in to help you. If you'd like to work directly with the consulting success team and receive personalized coaching and support to optimize and grow your consulting business, marketing, and revenue, visit consultingsuccess.com to learn more and apply today. Okay, so now let me tell you a little bit more about Sean, who's widely recognized for his exceptional expertise in launching new technology innovations. Now, as you're listening to today's episodes, a few things I particularly want you to hone in on. The first being how solving the Sunday afternoon problem could be the key to growing your business. How to create a market message map to sell to big companies. How to use ChatGPT to grow your firm. Why getting no's means you're getting closer to getting what you want. How to optimize your email signature to book more calls the value of in-person events, a positioning exercise to help you grow your firm, and how to navigate your consulting firm through a recession, plus so much more. Here to share with you his incredible insight is Sean Shepard. Enjoy. I thought where we could start our conversation here today is for you to kind of take us back in time a little bit. What were you doing before you were serving as a managing partner at U Plus? Yeah, well, I mean, I spent 30 years as a serial tech entrepreneur, mostly on the business, business sales and marketing side of those startups. Most recently, I had uh, GrowthX, which was a venture fund, B2B seed stage venture fund, and the first global product market fit accelerator for startups, focused on developing products and developing markets and making money as opposed to many accelerators, which are developed focused on developing markets and developing products and raising money. And I wasn't going to do another fund or a long-term commitment. I was looking to get back into the operating side after being an operator and then going into an investor. Wanted to get back in. Got dragged into corporate innovation quite by accident. Was helping my portfolio at GrowthX get traction with some large enterprises and realized, and they realized that they needed help with their own internal ventures, some of which incorporated my portfolio company and others did not. But they just didn't really have the right people or know how to do it. And so I started helping them. And then I ran across U Plus because they had an awesome delivery engine of people that could build, design, and deploy and implement these technologies and develop them. But they didn't have the commercialization side. That was my side. So we joined forces and created the U Plus methodology whereby we create new revenue growth, net new revenue growth through new business creation. And we start with ideation, go through testing and validation, build, launch, scale, all the standard things a startup would do, but with corporations. Several things you just talk, kind of mentioned there I want to dig a little bit deeper into. But to start off, you've been the serial entrepreneur. You've built companies. You've been an investor. You run a fund. You're now kind of back into working inside of a company. And I wonder if you could share a little bit about kind of like the mindset or the deciding factors, like what were you thinking about or thinking through to make the decision to go from being an entrepreneur and then to running a fund or being an investor and kind of get back into business. But this time it's not your company directly. You become kind of part of a company. So how do you kind of view that and think about it? Like, why not just start another company of your own? Why 
in this case, decide to get involved with another company? Yeah. So to clarify, you know, the company was 12 years old that had a strong track record. I bought half the company. So it's more of my own sort of private equity opportunity, which I had never done before. I love the founder. I love the team, love their values, love their approach to corporate innovation and saw that I think we're very early on in how corporate innovation is going to rapidly grow. And new venture building is supposed to be a $1.7 trillion market by 2030. And most organizations don't do it well. And I always saw corporates having a distinct advantage in the startup ecosystem if they actually knew what to do, because they have the customers, they have the relationships, they have the assets, they have the resources, they have the reach, they have the brand, they have the expertise, they have all of those things. And if they just knew how to apply entrepreneurial thinking and an operating model around it, they could just win hand over fist every time. Because as a startup, you're just a stranger going to a strange place with a strange offering, asking other strangers to do strange things with you. And it makes it so much harder to get from zero to one, right? But if you can do it, think about, from my point of view, as that entrepreneur, if I had the backing of a major brand and resources and that ecosystem at my disposal, oh my God, crush it. So much easier to open those doors, get the conversations, sell into it. Exactly. 10 times faster and 10 times cheaper and 10 times more effective, right? All because you have access to that. Right. I have a question for you then, then on that. Sorry to interrupt, but as you speak about that exact issue, right? The startups, they don't have the brand name. They don't have the recognition in most cases, unless they've maybe built or sold other, other companies and so forth, or have the backing of some big well-known investor or firm. But I'm interested in kind of two sides of this business development kind of challenge. So one being you've worked with a lot of startups, you run your own startups, right? You've invested and so forth, involved in that space. From a business development perspective, what have you seen works the best for, let's say, a relatively new company that doesn't have that big brand name behind them to actually get meetings, get appointments, kind of get in the door into these larger organizations that they want to sell into? What is the playbook or what works best in that area? Well, it's relationships first. I mean, if you have relationships or people that can get you to the right people, that's great. If you don't, you have to have some very compelling content that identifies problems that are very real for the people that you're trying to reach. I call it the solving the Sunday afternoon problem. Tell me more about that, about the Sunday afternoon. Well, that's the person that, that starts thinking about work on Sunday afternoon and the biggest problems they're going to face come Monday. And what are those recurring issues they're always thinking about? And then what is the wedge use case for solving that Sunday afternoon problem? And then how do you deliver a message compelling enough and unique enough to the right place and time to get that person's attention. That's the focus, especially in weird economic times like we have now. If you're not part of the organization's top two or three priorities, you're not going to get any attention. So what is the format of that content? I mean, does the format matter in terms of, is it video? Is it written? Is it? It's whatever that audience prefers. It's not about what we think. It's about how they consume information, right? So it's different for everyone. And the format of the messaging is different for every channel. We call it building a market message map. So what's the value proposition, right? Who's your audience? What are they looking to do differently? And then how do they think they're going to be looking at doing it differently? And then you deliver a holding message or what I call a recruiting message. Because when you're early stage, you're not trying to sell. You shouldn't be trying to sell your product or service. You should be recruiting people who share your vision, understand your current reality, and are willing to give you the two things you need the most right now as you're learning, their time and their truth. And that time and the truth will lead to the revenue and then ultimately to scalable options in the form of, I now have a happy cohort of early referenceable customers that will tell the world they're better off with me than without me and why and how. And I can use that to scale my business. And so it's a very different attitude, in my view, or a different approach than trying to sell well, so yeah, it sounds like it's very much more focused on relationship building. And I'm wondering, how do you view that approach? So is the outreach to a prospective client more based on sharing that content and then looking to have a conversation around that content if it resonates with them? And if it doesn't, maybe it doesn't, but you're trying to look for those people who do resonate with it. You're trying to find kind of the hot buttons, the pain points that are painful enough for them that they're excited 
or at least willing to kind of talk or to explore that with you. And so the focus is not trying to sell them on your offering. It's more simply about, do they have these pain points and do they want to have maybe a conversation around it? Can you add anything more to that? Or how do you kind of view that? That's absolutely right. The second best answer is no. And the sooner you can get there, the better. So you want to create messaging that either resonates or doesn't quickly. So by clearly articulating who your audience is very quickly, geographically, demographically, psychographically, whatever it is, for people like this, who are actively looking to make this kind of a change through this approach, that's your kind of your opening market message. If you agree with that, if you are this person, you agree with this worldview and you are actively seeking to make a change, and this is an interesting way of doing it, okay, let's have a conversation. And if you're not, you're not. Because typically you're a small entity, one, two people trying to get to as many people as you can. You don't have the time. Get to the folks that have that innovative early adopter mindset are actively looking to solve a problem that you can help them with. Have you found ways to identify or have some earlier indication of who those people are most likely to be? So for example, is it a job title? Is it that they've entered into an organization within a certain period of time? Or are there any kind of factors that have that you found that are helpful to kind of get a sense of who those people might be? Well, that's what user interviews are all about, right? So if you have a concept that you want to validate, so you've got a hypothesis about a problem that you're solving, a hypothesis about how you might solve the problem, and a hypothesis about for whom you're going to solve that problem. We call it the initial customer profile, not the ideal, because there's a different mindset and different set of attributes of the people that are willing to work with you right now versus once you're established. And then you go out and you start interviewing humans that meet those profiles and you construct your customer interview framework in a way that gets to the unbiased truth as much as you can. This is what UX designers are really great at, user researchers and user interviewers are. And I don't just mean putting this stuff into chat GPT and then getting a spit out of what things might look like. You still need humans to go out and validate because it's a human to human exercise to get from zero to one. And for a small consulting firm or somebody with limited resources that necessarily can't invest thousands of dollars in getting somebody to do that kind of research for them, how would you advise them on being able to, to capture some of that information or get those insights? Well, I would say today, I mean, given the what day, May 31st, 2023, I mean, ChatGPT and offshoots of that are a fabulous way for you to accelerate the research necessary to determine who's got what problem and how you might be able to deliver a message that's compelling enough to get them to solve it. Consulting world is very relationship oriented, however, right? And I strongly suggest people build an ecosystem of other consultants that share the same customers, but do different things that can help each other out and can be walked into that boardroom where those conversations are happening because that's where those decisions get made. Part of what you were saying before in terms of like the value of actually getting a no, a lot of people are scared of getting no's. And so they take less action because they're right afraid of getting kind of that rejection or, or hearing no's. To me, it sounded like you're saying no. Hearing no is actually a good thing. The more no's you get, like you're closer to finding the people that, that really do want this and those that will resonate with. My question, or I guess the thought around that, that I love your perspective on is, does that mean that the approach in your mind is one where it's based more on volume, meaning you need a bigger list and you have to go after more people? And I'm wondering about that because today, so many executives and decision makers are inundated with sales messages and just hype and false, like all this stuff is just hitting them. So messages that lack personalization oftentimes don't get as good of a response. So how do you view being personalized enough where you're really able to do that with a smaller group? But if you're a smaller group, you might not get as many yeses as you'd like, right? Or not be able to kind of touch as many people as, as you like. So how do you kind of think about that volume versus value type of equation? Yeah, I'm not a volume fan. I don't think it helps. I'm a fan of having a highly curated, targeted audience with a clear set of problems that you can help solve for, where you address that through your kind of messaging and you go where they live, right? You go to the events and the conferences, you participate in the webinars, you, you produce content that helps uh, educate them. You come up with highly customized me messaging. You show them things they haven't seen. You tell them things they haven't heard, right? Give them a perspective on a, on a problem set that they haven't experienced before. So I'm a big fan of doing it in that fashion because I don't think it helps, especially with small consultancies. I mean, you know, how many people can you support, right? So how many a shotgun approach doesn't help you certainly doesn't help them or whoever that audience is. Yeah. We see that as well with clients that we work with. So we talk kind of about the approach 
if you're a smaller startup or have limited resources. Now, if we kind of shift more to you plus and, and, and your firm, being more established, having worked with some very large organizations, I mean, you have that track record of success. What is the approach that you take today and that you have found most effective to, to get meetings, to get appointments, essentially build a pipeline with qualified leads and people that you want to work with? Anything different? I mean, we start with our worldview and our philosophy about why most innovations fail. 95% of corporate innovations fail. Only 3% ever get to 50 million in annual recurring revenue. Why is that? So all the research and all of our experience across the board says the same things. It's mindset, skill set, lack of a framework. It's people and playbook. Not having the right stage relevant people with the right mindset and skill set and experience and a framework to execute with a clear set of outcomes about what are we trying to get to? Well, we want new revenue growth. Okay, well, what's the first step in getting new revenue growth? It's getting to product market fit with an idea. And what is that? It's that cohort of early customers I was telling you about that you can leverage in a market that's big enough for your organization to care about, right? All right, how do we do that? Well, we have a methodology, great. But do you have the right people? Do you have anybody in your organization that's ever built a startup? No, probably not. Or they've been acquired and then they've earned out and gone away. Or they've tried to hire them and they've just been uh, stifled. So they leave. Most of the entrepreneurs in these big companies are dead or retired. So we start with that worldview. And then we want to share that with the world. We have a very robust revenue ops strategy that has a stack, a tech stack attached to it with foundational content, webinars, in-person events are very important in our business, getting to know the teams that are responsible for new business building and big companies and the C-suite executives in person. Those are really important. Delivering foundational content through the form of webinars and articles and research and white papers and those sorts of things is really important. And thought leadership. I do a lot of public speaking. So does my business partner. So we do a lot of stage speaking and events. We promote the resumes and backgrounds of the individual consultants that work with us. We share our success stories, right? We've got 60 some case studies on the website for every industry and sector you can imagine. And so sharing those stories. People have been after us to write a book. We haven't got around to it, but that's also a great calling card in the consulting industry is if you write a book and today with AI, you can probably write one. I know a guy who's been writing a book a day for 30 days. It takes about three hours to produce the book. It's ridiculous. I don't know if it's valuable yet, but I think it's just sort of a point. And then from there, it's just constantly following up until they tell you to shut up or that this isn't a fit, right? And as you said earlier, getting to know is absolutely the truth. What you're trying to do is find fit. Don't think of it as rejection. Don't sell, seek fit. If people And fit means, do they have a need that you... It's banned. Budget, authority, need, and timing. Do you have budget? Are you the authority figure who can make a decision? Do you have an acknowledged and recognized need that we both mutually agreed upon? And can I actually solve for that need for you through a scope of some sort? And then timing, even if all those things line up, like when is the right time for you to prioritize something like this? I love that. I mean, so clearly it's not just one thing that you're doing, it's multiple things. In your experience, is that the approach that people should take from day one? Well, it depends on the size and scale of their business, right? We're a 150 person organization. So, you know, we're not tiny, but we're not huge either. And we're highly specialized. But yes, when you get to a place where you need some support to scale your outreach and do those things, you'll know when that is. It's when you're just too busy to continue to create it. And there's a lot of ways to leverage outside tools and resources and people and contractors to help you do that stuff. One thing I noticed, Sean, is that on your website, it's very easy to book a 20-minute call with you. Right there's there's very little barrier to somebody clicking a button, accessing your calendar instantly, and then scheduling a call with you. How helpful has that been, or how effective has that been in generating qualified leads and business? It's been more effective. It hasn't been as effective in generating cold inbound leads as it has been in scheduling meetings with people that you want to be that you're trying to get meetings with. Just by having that link in my signature line and referencing it, it makes it so much easier than going back and forth on the calendar Olympics of seven emails. So you want to make it easy to get the right people to get time with you. We've got some filters and things set up there. With my calendar, you can't get it if, if it's a personal email account, for example. There's got to be a business account. And then you need to give me a business reason why I should accept the meeting. And I'm okay with that. Like I've always been an open 
accessible person. I want to help people. That's what I want to do. Well, so I was wondering, like, how do you manage that? Let's say somebody in a country or a type of company, like whatever your kind of qualification criteria are, if it doesn't match, how do you make sure that your calendar is not getting filled with people that is not the best use of your time? Well, I need to have information, right? So that information needs to be in the meeting request. And if it's not there and I go do the research and I look it up, I'll determine right there and there whether or not it's worth having the meeting. And if not, I'll politely decline and tell them why. Gosh, okay. One thing that you mentioned that I thought was very interesting, because I know a lot of consultants kind of struggle with this or it's something that they're not clear on, is you, you said that you promote or your, your company actually promotes the team or kind of the individual consultants or the kind of individual contributors. So it's not just about the Sean and your partners show. It's not just about the company. Like you actually want to put the spotlight on some of your team members. And one of the reasons why we've heard that people are concerned about doing that is, well, if this person the spotlights on them, maybe they're going to get poached by a competitor or maybe they're going to go off and do their own thing. How do you think about that? Well, first of all, I think that's fixed mindset thinking. Uh, second of all, my philosophy in life is I want whatever is best for my people. And if that's going somewhere else, that's great. And I shouldn't resent them for that or take a protectionist view of what this looks like. The reality is, is that the leadership is only going to engage a certain number of people in an engagement anyway. You need to have strong people that are supporting you if you're going to grow this business. We promote all these people individually. We do employee spotlights every week of different people. We make announcements on new hires. We write content about our culture and that now we're a fully distributed team that doesn't have to hire for location and can only focus on skills and culture. Those things are important to us because that's what we believe. Again, not everybody's into that and that's fine, but um, it works for us because it's who we are. So I'm wondering, we talked a little bit about business development, kind of marketing content. Is there anything that you're doing today different than you've done in the past that you're just finding is working really well? Especially post-COVID, it's events, right? It's any and all in-person engagement opportunities you can get. I think people are starving to get back out and see each other again. And in our business, it is very much a trust business. Getting to know you before doing business together is really important. And then being there time and time again. You get great long-term engagements from people you've seen three, four times on the road, right? Various things. Be willing to invest your time in those things. How do you view or how do you kind of make that decision? There's a lot of different events that you could go to. What do you personally look for? Well, we always look at the audience, right? Who's the audience and what's the structure of the event? What do you mean by structure? I just mean, uh, is it small and intimate where you get to spend time with people? Are there opportunities for speed dating and networking? These new apps like Brella out there that are fantastic. Brella? What's that? Brella, it's called. It's uh, an app that conferences are using now as a way to allow the community to get together pre-event and then decide when they're going to book 10-minute meetings together at, at pre-assigned tables with numbers on them. And all you do is show up and the person's there and you get to have a chat. And you're not going to solve the world's problems in 10 minutes, but you're going to at least start the relationship and then you follow up afterwards. So those kinds of things are great. Is it strong educational? Is it on brand, right? I mean, who are the people and who are the people putting it on? Where is it? Obviously, what's the audience? What are your opportunities to engage that audience? Do you have an opportunity to speak? Always try and get a speaking slot first by creating value through content that people want to hear, right? I can tell, I mean, it's very clear to me that you have this kind of abundance mindset, right? As opposed to a scarcity mindset. But I want to ask you about competition. There's, from the perspective of there are multiple firms that work in digital innovation or in taking technology to the market. How do you personally view creating that differentiation or kind of how you guys gone about and what have you focused on to create differentiation in the marketplace? Or how do you think about that? I would say... I mean, normally you can do a positioning exercise, right? Well, how are we different? And that's super important. I'm not minimizing at all. It's really important. But I think we were different from the get-go because of the people and the background and experience of our people. We all come from the startup world. We all know what it takes to get to product market fit. So we structure our teams and our approach accordingly. A lot of these other firms will do elements of what we do, but very few of them, and I haven't seen many that have a, let's say, a one-stop shop approach to being the co-founders of your idea, where we can design it, we can build it, we can launch it, we can sell it, commercialize it, and scale it, right? 
It sounds like you almost do everything for many of these organizations. Well, that's the idea. If you're going to fund a startup, whether you're a venture capitalist like me who puts $3 million into a seed stage, but what are you paying for? Paying for them to build a team, get that thing to product market fit, and then it went A round. And what does that team usually look like? Well, it's usually somewhere between 10 to 15 people doing product work, market work, and ops and delivery and customers, everything along the cycle, hopefully focused on getting that first cohort of customers, right? So you got people building the product, you got people designing the product, you've got people uh, marketing and selling the product, you've got people uh, supporting the customers, you've got all engineering, you've got all that stuff. So that's a 12 to 15 person team. You know what most corporates do? They throw shared resources at something like this and they futz with it a little bit and then it doesn't work. And then the people go back to their old jobs and pretend like it never happened. Or they'll do have they'll pay an innovation firm to do some research or maybe do some wireframes and design up some comps or do some business model innovation workshops or train some people and get them all excited about the culture of innovation. And then nothing ever happens. Right. Or they'll just hire, they'll ask their internal IT team to go build this thing for them. But they don't build products, they build support systems. And it's all very different. So we felt like it was obvious what our differentiation was once we got in and started to look at the market and how people approach it. But it's a very worthy exercise for everybody to go through a positioning and differentiation exercise to really answer that question, why us or why me? So one thing that I, I saw on your website is you have this kind of visual where people can see how your company compares to hiring other types of companies. What does a typical UX design firm provide? Or what do you get from a typical management consulting firm? What was the thought process kind of behind that? And how do you guys use it? Do people just kind of find it by themselves on the website? Is it something that you actually point to and talk about in presentations? Can you just give a little bit more background around like why you created it and how you use it? We created it because I think you have to productize even a service offering to some degree. And I think people are very visual. And I also know that most organizations don't have an operating model for innovation, for executing on innovation. So we show them our model and say, this is how we operate. This is the framework. And you can use it on your own if you want. We'll teach you how to use it. But you need a process, right? You also need the right people. And we can provide both or parts of both. And it helps frame very quickly for people who we are and what we do. You kind of touched on this a little bit earlier on, but there's certainly a lot of noise in the media right now about the economy, about uncertainty. Some companies are pulling back on their spend or they're just delaying making decisions. Others are certainly seeing great opportunities. But I'm wondering for you, Sean, as somebody who's kind of dialed into many different organizations at different sizes, what are you kind of seeing in the marketplace right now? I'm seeing exactly that. I'm seeing a lot of uncertainty. I'm seeing people delaying decisions, pulling back, making layoffs, not doing things they were doing before, taking longer to make decisions. So growth for us has not been as fast this year as it had been in my two prior years with the company. But I'm 50. I've been through a lot of these. So it will turn around at some point. For those that haven't been through as many of these as you have or Certainly not. Maybe people have been through them, but they've been through them maybe more like working inside of an organization as opposed to running an organization. Maybe they're feeling a bit more of the pinch right now or just unsure of like how will things play out and how does that impact their business. What's your mindset? What are you telling yourself or what are the thoughts going through your mind? Or what are you telling your team to keep everybody moving forward? Well, first, I'm not blaming myself for it. There are things out of your control, right? There's only certain things you can control. So the second thing is, Simplify and focus. What do you mean by that? Can you just elaborate a little bit more? I mean, across the board, simplify your story, your message, who you're targeting, the work that you're doing, how you're approaching the market to grow your business. Don't do the things that aren't paying your bills and putting food on your table. And then do twice as much of those things and half of everything else and focus on that. And you can and will survive it. We know the whole story, right? When you come out the other side, you'll be much stronger for it. Right. Yeah. Because not everybody will survive. Or a lot of people right now are just kind of sticking their head in the sand, hoping that things pass. Yeah. I can't predict the future any more than anybody else does. Is there anything else that you haven't mentioned right now that you are doing right now or you're pushing your team to do and encouraging them to do in terms of how to navigate the slower budget cycles or people kind of just being slower to make decisions? You've got to be more customized. You've got to be more flexible. You've got to have that do whatever it takes sort of attitude in times like these. You've got to be creative, figuring out the different ways you can support and serve your customers. 
is that flexibility in your mind when it comes to pricing of projects or? Yeah, absolutely. Pricing is part of it. Pricing and scope, terms, all of those things should be on the table if you want the work. And so areas that you may not typically be as flexible, now you're finding or encouraging the team to be more flexible given the current situation. Yeah. And be open to negotiating and just figuring it out with your customers, right? Speaking of pricing and fees, how do you structure your kind of pricing or strategy for pricing inside of the company? You have obviously a very clear process and kind of a program that you take people through, but what is the pricing inside of U Plus based on? So it depends on the type of project and the scope of it. But to say we're taking an idea from the beginning all the way through to launch and scale, we charge for an agile team on a monthly basis. And then we'll do fixed scope, fixed pricing, fixed milestone stuff as well. And then when we have to, we'll provide hourly rates, typically with public entity sort of RFPs and those things, you've got to do that. But we're fee for service. In the situation where it sounds like the majority, it's not hourly, it's it's kind of, as I said, fixed fee, more project-based work. Are you still tracking or, or managing? I'm wondering, kind of, are there certain metrics that you're looking at in terms of utilization or um, so w- what are those key metrics that you personally are paying attention to that, that ma- when it comes to pricing? Well, utilization rate is always an important one in this business, right? Margin is an important one. The margin at the time you close the contract, and then can you increase that margin through the contract by being more efficient? Those are the things that we're focused on. And then making sure that we always give our people a good variety of different options and projects to work on, because that's what they love to do. They're startup folks. They like that variety. And how do you track all that? I mean, is there a certain app or technology you use for tracking the margin and kind of hours and profitability, like all that? We've got a strong development team, right? We built something in-house that works for us. Awesome. Okay. And then you talked about, yeah, ways to kind of increase margin. Are there certain things that you do that you've just found really effective or or how do you go about selling deeper into organizations? Yeah. First, you've got to deliver, right? So... Show yourself as somebody who can be trusted and reliable and deliver, and then just start asking for introductions from the people that do trust you and look for different opportunities where you can be helpful. In terms of finding those opportunities and having that conversation with a buyer, do you wait until you've delivered on that first engagement and kind of close that first series of scope? I do. Different people have different approaches. That's my style. I try not to ask until I've delivered, right? Give before you take. Last 12 months or so, is there any initiative or I guess big lesson that you've learned? Anything maybe didn't go the way that you expected, Sean, and looking back? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's been a bunch of projects get killed like midstream because of market conditions or other factors that had nothing to do with us. It's frustrating. Anything from within those experiences or maybe others that serves as a lesson for you that you go, okay, yeah, we went through this. It didn't turn out the way we thought, but we've now done something as a result of that that has made us stronger. Yeah, I think some things we've made some changes to how we bill and how we charge and when and where and how we commit to milestones. Give me a little more detail on like within those things, what did you change when it comes to how you bill or charge or kind of the, the lessons? The easiest way to say it without sharing too much proprietary information, we've become better at selling and delivering the way people are used to buying in large organizations. Because even if they're trying to do innovative things, they've got some very old ways of, of thinking about uh, pricing and deliverables and activities and milestones that are not typically used in the startup world. You wear many hats, you go across a lot of different things. Uh, you put an agile team on something. Yeah, you might think you're getting 40 hours a week, but you're probably getting 50 to 60 because these people are really, really committed to what they're doing. And we're not charging you for that. And some people don't understand that until you go back and do an audit of the hours and find out that they got so much more value than we asked them for because we wanted that long term. That we want, we need the teams to be agile. We need them to have the ability to just live it on a dime based on what they learned from the market because you don't know what you don't know yet. These are not well defined until you get the information from the market. It's not like a traditional IT project. How do you manage that? So let's say initially the thinking behind the billing is the equivalent, even though if you're not using hourly, it's let's just say it's 40 hours. But when you get in there, you find that you have to actually have to spend 50 or 60 hours. Is that a conversation you're having with the buyer in advance? Like, How do you handle that so that you're not really eroding the profitability of that project 
Yeah. So that's another lesson, right? Is how well defined is the scope from the beginning and the spec of what the work is, especially if it's technology based stuff. The more defined, we always tell our clients, the more defined the spec is, and we will evaluate and assess that spec, the more accurate and specific we can be about pricing and milestones. But there's also the opposite end of that, which is I have no idea. So if I have no idea, then you're going to pay me to scope all this to give you that answer, which takes a lot of time. And then there's the stuff in the middle where sometimes we have to take a risk and say, yeah, we'll provide a fixed timeline and milestone for this. But, and we might go 10% over, we might go 10% under. But this way you can get your budget approved. Yeah, there we go. Back to working flexibly in some ways, right, with the client. So just a couple more questions here and we'll wrap up, Sean. I really appreciate your time and you sharing. You've accomplished a lot in your career, even to this point, right? And lots more to come. But what are one or two daily habits that you feel just kind of give you the edge, give you that superpower, help you to perform at the highest levels? Is there anything that, that you do on a daily basis? I try to do a little bit of light exercise every morning. I try to not look at my phone until I've gone through my routine. Does it start at a certain time? Do you do certain things? What does that look like? It's not always easy for it to be the same time because of the nature of the business I'm in and, and the other demands in my life. But I'm always usually the first one up. And then I go right into my routine of doing my exercise and getting ready for the day and avoiding looking at the phone or anything. Knowing, of course, from the night before when I actually have my first meetings, right? And then I try to be up and doing some deep work and response work before I get into those meetings. So I'm always responsive. There's a couple of pieces of media I consume on a daily basis that help me mentally, emotionally, physically. The Daily Stoic by Ryan Holiday is one of my all-time favorites. Atomic Habits from James Clear is great. Uh, Jim McEwen's Essentialism, another fantastic one. I've got a sleep app called Aura that's fantastic. You got the ring? Yeah, it's not them. It's A-U-R-A. Oh, okay. I'm wearing the Aura ring. That's O-U-R-A. So Right. This is Aura. The, it's a sleep app that has meditative speakers and sounds and all sorts of things that, uh, that really help me regulate and sleep calmly. Those are the main things. And of course, the other thing is I'm just a naturally positive person who's always persevered and been persistent and determined to get shit done. So it's just my nature to look at the bright side of most things. That's great. You mentioned several authors. I mean, one of the questions I often like to ask people is for a book that they've read or listened to in the last six months could be fiction or nonfiction. I mean, you, you've kind of rattled off a bunch of classics there, but is there any other book that comes to mind that you, again, could be fiction or nonfiction that you might recommend to people? Yeah, well, I keep a copy of Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, the Greg Hayes version, by my bed. And then I also keep Wisdom of the Age Ages by Wayne Dyer, which is a compilation of a lot of really smart philosophy. Discipline is Destiny, which was Ryan Holiday's new book I just read, which is fantastic. Any and Everything by Jordan Peterson has been fantastic for me and my family as well. Yeah, lately... It's kind of a, re a reliance on some a lot of those things. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, I love that the focus of those is not just purely business, right? It's stuff that's impacting your life. Well, look, we're in professional services. Is there a difference between personal and professional? I would argue there's not. If you develop the person, you'll develop a professional. I've come to believe that just generally after 30 years of doing this. So the skills that you develop in the consulting world are human skills and their relationship skills. Andy Paul's new book on sales is fantastic, and the name escapes me now. And I feel terrible because I've been on his podcast like three times. Sell Without Selling Out. Yeah, Sell Without Selling Out. Fantastic. So he and I share this worldview that you know technology has just made sales very transactional. We're losing relationships. We're over-relying on tools. We're not treating each other well enough. Certainly in society, we see a lot of that. And so to bring back integrity and humanity to sales. And I think he's just, I don't know if there's anybody more articulate right now or, or better voice when it comes to selling around that than Andy. Yeah, he's been on the podcast here as well. So, Oh, good. Okay. We're big believers in that. And a couple of our past companies had the word relationship in them. Even in, when we had a company in Japan, it was Kanke culture. So Kanke being the 
Japanese word for relationship. So I'm with you on that, Sean. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation between Sean and Michael. If you did, then as always, be sure you hit that subscribe button wherever you listen to your favorite shows. And if you want to help support the Consulting Success Podcast, we'd ask you either head over to Apple Podcasts, where there you'll have the chance to leave a rating and review, or you can share this episode out with a friend or colleague who you feel like would truly enjoy listening to today's episode. Also a reminder, if you want to work directly with the consulting success team and receive personalized coaching and support to optimize and grow your consulting business, marketing, and revenue, head over to consultingsuccess.com to learn more and apply today. Again, thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. This is the end of the line for us this week. Until next time. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. For more episodes and to subscribe, rate, and leave a review, head on over to iTunes. And if you'd like to develop consistent lead flow and a highly profitable consulting business, learn more about our coaching programs at consultingsuccess.com. 